Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Stoner Winslet, who serves as founding artistic director of the Richmond Ballet Professional Company. Stoner, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aaron. It's great to be here. Well, I'm so excited to, to talk with you and to learn a little bit more about the Richmond Ballet, which I think would be great just for all of our audience, since we're not only national, but international, uh, to get a sense, but then to really delve into this. Um, and I'm excited to share that this show is co-curated with the University of Richmond under the leadership of Ron Crutcher, a mutual dear friend and past guest on the show. Um, so with that, the um, if you could kind of just share the scope and, and breath kind of overall focus of the Richmond Ballet, that would be great to just give kind of the audience a context. Well, the Richmond Ballet is headquartered here in our capital city in Virginia, and we are not only the Richmond Ballet, but we're also the State Ballet of Virginia. And we've enjoyed um, in our professional era, which started in 1984, some really wonderful national and international um, performing opportunities. We performed at the Joyce in, the New in New York City many times, and then we were invited by the Meet in Beijing Festival to do a two-week four-city tour in China. And then we were invited by the Royal Ballet School to perform at the Royal Opera House in London and out in Richmond, England at White Lodge. So we like to think that we carry the uh, good word and goodwill of the citizens of Richmond and Virginia around the world with dance, the international language. Awesome. And so you've obviously just had, you know, this extraordinary career and and in looking at the need, right, for ballet in Richmond, in in Virginia and and not only that, but that really being the leader in the state and and uh, and nationally. For those who say, you know, there are some who say, well, sure, we kind of, you know, like the arts, but there are all of these other things, maybe social services, et cetera. And then even within the arts. What do you say to those people who say, why ballet? What, what is its role in our communities and why is it important? Well, like I just said, um, you know, dance is an international language that crosses all borders and that um, touches our very souls in a place that words can't. And I think the mission of the Richmond Ballet is to uplift and awaken the human spirit. And Sure, ballet came out of the courts of kings and queens in Italy and France centuries ago, but it has evolved with the times and with the different um, current climate. And I really feel that now more than ever, that dance is a unifying force in communities. And it's something that we all need that can bring us together. And we have, um, Every, every face in our community is represented somehow in our school and on our stage. And the power of all those people coming together in harmony and beauty is something that um, I just feel like the world needs now more than ever. Uh, well, I, I, needless to say, could not agree more. And, and it is so critically important. And, um, and, uh, and just the way you just describe it, it's such... Um, uh, kind of a, a, a beautiful articulation of this need in our society. So kind of following along that and thinking about a lot of our audience who are fellow arts administrators, arts leaders, and are charged with looking at their own audiences. Um, there are those who will look at ballet or from the outside and say, it seems to have a singular audience and, um, and or doesn't. And there are some such as yourself who are really leading this way and broadening the audience. Could you kind of just share a little more about what that means to you and any kind of effective mechanisms that you've discovered that would be helpful to other leaders about broadening the audience for our disciplines? 
You know, one thing that I think helps a lot in the ballet world is um, Balanchine was the one that when he first came to the U.S. and Lincoln Kirsten wanted him to start a truly American ballet company and said, but first a school. There's only one way to dance ballet, and that's to be trained by someone who is passing that flame down. So we've had a very strong not-for-profit school since 1975. And when the school is open to the community and has opportunities for people, regardless of financial resources and then has an outreach arm that goes into we have 2,000 children at the peak not during the pandemic but in our fourth grade program and then we make it possible for those children to study you know families will come to places that their children are interested in so we have a little bit of an advantage with that because we bring in all parts of the community in the children. And so the parents will come and see their child in a workshop performance and then their child in the Nutcracker and then they'll fall in love with a dancer on the stage. So they'll come to the studio theater. And I think that's a really good way for ballet companies is through the children. Awesome, awesome, you know, critically important. And you know, it's kind of interesting too, when you just reference that, and of course thinking as we're hopefully coming out of the pandemic. Um, how has that affected your work at all and how um, you're leading the organization? Do you see any things that will be different moving forward that were informed because of this experience we've all had over the past year and a half? Yeah, it's been a, a wild ride, hasn't it? Um, <laughs> You know, I, I always think, um, and back to why we're important anyway, is that artists need to be the creative leaders. And when the pandemic hit, most of the performing arts just shuddered and said, that's it. But I took a very different attitude. And a lot of the ballet companies said, well, we'll just go dark until January. We'll be back in January. And my hand was up saying, you know, who says coronavirus dies on January 1st, 2021? If you say it does, then let's pull in and we'll wait for that. But what if it doesn't? So isn't our job right now, if our mission is to uplift and awaken the human spirit, don't we need it now more than ever? Isn't our job to look at the reality and say, what can we do? to achieve the mission in this time. So we reopened our school on July 6th with 24 cleanings a day, um, no more than 10 children in the class, um, students masked, pianists masked, teachers masked. That went well, no contagion. So on August 17th of last year, we brought back our professional company and we actually have our own studio theater and we socially distanced it from 250 to 63 people. And we danced 96 pu six public shows last year in masks with audiences in masks. We have 400 new donors from that effort and um, just a lot of fans in the community that would just leave the theater crying saying that they felt safe, they felt happy, they felt alive. So I'm hoping we have a whole lot of new friends after the pandemic. That's amazing and I think is such a testament to right, this type of leadership when we're faced with these challenges. Um, and that's really what stands out to me is this of kind of just, we can't just stop or give up and the, the importance, the role of our arts disciplines that we're bringing to young people and to our audiences is so important. How do we innovate? Um, so I definitely, I love that. Um, and as you kind of move forward, do you think, are there any aspects that have it caused any shifts where say, you know, next year you might do something differently because of something that you learned through these experiences? But we did also um, record our shows so that people who didn't feel comfortable coming to the theater could get them virtually. And we're really debating right now whether to continue to do that. On the one hand, there are people in retirement homes that are you know, understandably afraid they might fall and don't want to come out, but love the ballet and you'd like them to see it. On the other hand, part of what we provide is that sense of community and live theater and being with other human beings, which I think we're all craving right now. So the jury's still out on, on how we do that. I think what I would like to do is to start to produce a product that's not just a recorded show, but maybe is choreographed for film or video um, as a like evolving, <laughs> evolving part of our art form. Right. Something been thinking about. We've also um, been able to, as the State Ballet of Virginia, we were 
training in person, but most schools around the state were closed and we've been zooming in students from their living rooms into our ballet classes. And I think in some of the smaller communities that don't have good schools, that would be something that would be great to continue to help those students um, train. Awesome, awesome. So unfortunately, we're just about out of time, but I always like to ask of, of our extraordinary leaders, you know, there's through some of those things you were describing and, and moving forward and, and trying to broaden audiences that there are days that have to be tough and challenges that might feel like they're insurmountable. How do you as an administrative arts leader find inspiration, draw, what do you draw upon for strength during the toughest of times? You know, <laughs> I think um, a professor of mine at Smith, Rosalind Mill, used to say, you know, if you're a dancer and you have other gifts, then it's your job to use those gifts to make another place for other people to dance when you can no longer dance. Some people call it going to the dark side, you know? And I sit there in my office on Zoom call after Zoom call, I sit in board meetings, I go on fundraising calls, I teach company class and that kind of thing too, but the dancers in the company know when it is and when I, when I can't take it anymore, I'll just walk into rehearsal and sit for a while and they know it's their job to inspire me so that I can keep going, so that I can make a place for them and many others to dance. It comes right here in this building from our own dancers and our own students. It makes your heart just soar to see how hard they work and what they're doing. Oh, Stoner Winslet, you truly are one of the arts engines who is powering human creativity in our field. Thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you to Ron for putting us together. <laughs> Absolutely.